If you have a Bible, would you open up to the book of Exodus, chapter 31? I had every intention of going through 31 and 32, but it ain't going to happen. Just, you know, something really kind of just hit me as we were going through the book of Exodus. And remember where we've been. We've been, we've been going chapter by chapter, the children of Israel being freed from slavery. They had been protected by God by, from the Egyptian army that had come after them. And God had, had seen them all the way to the other side of the Red Sea. And then they begin this, this journey of, of learning to trust God and learning to walk with God. And, and now as Moses was now walking up Mount Sinai, he gets instructions on how they were to worship God. He's giving them instructions and the blueprints for building the tabernacle, for designing the garments that the priests would wear, the furnishings that would go inside of the tabernacle, and all of it in great detail of, of what it was to look like as the children of Israel would gather together to worship. And it, was, it tells us in the book of Hebrews that it was a pattern of the heavenly throne the heavenly tabernacle, the place where God sits. And so he was to follow these instructions clearly. Not only did he give them all the, the, the blueprint and details, but he also had told them earlier in chapter 31 that he would raise up men to accomplish this vision that God had given them. He would raise up Be Bezalel to, to be the, the artisan that would now design or f actually fulfill the design that God had given them. Look at, look at verse 3 of chapter 31. I thought this was cool. Watch what it says. And I filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding, in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. You see, guys, he, he, here's the picture, is that God had given Moses this, this instruction, and now Moses is handing this off to Bezalel, and Bezalel was going to be anointed with the Spirit of God so that he can go and accomplish that vision. And all of these pieces, man, and all of it so that the children of Israel can know God. It was earlier in Exodus chapter 29, and just back up a little bit, just to kind of get the perspective here. Look at 29 verse 44. That's what he says. So I will consecrate the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. I will consecrate both Aaron and his sons to minister me as priest. Verse 45. And I will dwell among the children of Israel, and I will be their God. Watch this. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. Why was God doing all of this? So that they would know him. So that they would have an intimacy with the Creator, an intimacy with God. And so Moses now is up on the mountain and he's getting this instruction from God on how this relationship was to look like. And the only way you have a relationship, what wasn't, what wasn't a one-time introduction, right? A relationship is a, is a continual conversation, continual knowing. And so God was going to lay out for them how that, that was going to look. He was going to tell them that you're going you're gonna to know me as you spend time learning about me. And that's what the Sabbath was all about. God is going to give them some instructions on what the Sabbath day was to look like. And I think there's a lot of confusion when it comes to the Sabbath day. And that's why as I was going through it, I go, man, this is, this, this is God trying to explain to his people why the Sabbath was important. Why this day that was set apart was to be honored and it was to be holy and it was to be kept. Now, I, I, I want to read verse 12 now. All the way to verse 18, and then we're going to come back and we're, we're going we're to expound upon it. Watch what he says. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath shall 
you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it will surely be put to death. For whoever does not work on it, or whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among the people. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And when he had made an end of speaking with him on the Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. Wow. I think this is one of those commands that sometimes we look over very kind of lightly and we just kind of go, oh, that, 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 was, that was something to do with the nation of Israel. It has nothing to do with me. And I think we're missing something if we do that, guys. There, there's something here that God is trying to convey to the children of Israel. This is the fourth time that God's going to tell them about the Sabbath day. He's got one more time toward the end of, of Exodus. He's going to tell them again. So five times in the book of Exodus, God's going to remind them to keep the Sabbath day. It was the first time when, when God had provided for them food for every day of the week. He says, six days I'm going to give you manna from heaven. And on the sixth day, I'm going to give you a double portion so that you have enough to carry you over on the Sabbath day, which is going to be the day of rest, and you're not to work on that day. I'm going to give you enough on the sixth day to provide for you for the Sabbath day. And so God had already established with them that it was to be a day of rest, and it was to be a day of rest so that the children of Israel would have a day where they were putting their concentration and their focus upon the worship of God. And so God had established this day of a very, a very sacred day so the children of Israel wouldn't do any work on that day. The second time he, he had told them was back in chapter 20. And in chapter 20, let, let me just take you back there real quick. If you remember there in verse 8 of chapter 20, God says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he hallowed it. And God, God had told the, the children of Israel within the Ten Commandments, right? Not only when he was providing manna for them, food for them, he tells them now, this is going to be one of the Ten Commandments that I leave you, is that one of the, the, the seventh day is to be set apart, a day of, of rest, and it was to be a day where you didn't do any labor. You, nor your animals, nor, nor any one of your servants, no one in your household was to work on that day. And he's going to remind them again in, in chapter 23 when he's telling them about social justice, right? L look at chapter 23, verse 11. Verse, actually, verse 10, he says, Six years you shall sow your, sow your land and gather its produce, but the seventh year you shall rest you shall let it rest and lie fo follow that the poor of your people may eat, that they may, and, and what they leave, the beasts of the field may eat. In like manner you shall do with your vineyards and on your olive grove. Six days you shall do your work, and on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your donkey may rest, and the sons of your female servants and the strangers 
may be refreshed. Interesting. That, that, you know, here God is telling them, you know, guys, this day isn't to be a day of work. It, it, it's to be, a, even your animals need a day of rest. Even your ground needs a year of rest. That there, there's going to be this precedence that's going to be set within your lives. That, that God has to be first. It's going to be a precedent within your life that you, you can't just meet with God on, on, a, on a yearly basis, not just in your feast days, but it has to be on a, on a weekly basis. And I would even encourage you on a daily basis that we're meeting with God. But there's something different about coming to the tabernacle, something different about gathering together with the body of Christ, with the saints. And, and what, what, what's interesting is that Right after he's telling the children of Israel in chapter 31, where we're at this, this evening, he, right after he's telling the children of Israel about building the tabernacle, he reminds them, look, guys, you got to keep the Sabbath holy. And I think it was very specific to Bezalel and all of these artisans are going to be working. To think about this. It was going to be the most important job they'd ever, ever undertaken. It was going to be the most important calling they had ever answered in their life was building the tabernacle they're going to be making the dwelling place of god and i'll get, i guarantee you there's going to be every reason to say man we, we this just work on the sabbath to get this thing done and god was telling them right at the bat man right right at the beginning before they even begin the work he's going to tell them guys keep the sabbath day holy make sure there's a day of rest that there's a time when you're coming to worship God and that you're allowing um, that time to be set apart and sacred. And I, and I, th I think th th there, there's something here that, that God is trying to instruct them. It's in chapter 35, I told you a little bit later on, he mentions it one more time, and I, I just want to touch it real quick. Look at chapter 35 real quick. Watch this. And Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together, and he said to them, These are the words which the Lord has commanded you to do. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh day shall be a holy day for you, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire throughout your dwelling on the Sabbath day. And Moses spoke to the congregation and to the children of Israel, saying, this is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take from among you an offering to the Lord. Whoever is willing heart, let him bring it, an offering to the Lord, gold, silver. And he gives them this long list of things. And he, here, here was the thing. They were just now going to begin the building of the temple. And God tells them one more time, Guys, I don't care what priorities you have. I don't care what task you're, you're, you're going to give yourself to. I don't even care if it's the building of the tabernacle. This day has to be set aside for me. And I think, I think it's, it's something that, that should be uh, an encouragement to each of us. Is that there's a day set aside where we're saying, man, I, I, I have to worship God. And, and, I, and I, I think as we go into the New Testament, he kind of lays some different parameters for us. And we'll look at that. But I, I don't think the, the, the concept of setting a day aside to worship God is taken away. Because the tabernacle was going to be the place where they had come to meet with God. And the tabernacle and the Sabbath day were going to be these, these commandments that, that they, were to, they were to keep. Coming to the tabernacle on the Sabbath day was going to be a priority for the nation of Israel. And as God is going to explain to them that it's a day that he set aside. Notice what he said there in verse 12 once again, back in chapter 31. Watch what he says. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, I'm sorry, verse 12 it is. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak also to the children of Israel saying, Surely, watch this, My Sabbath you shall keep. Whose Sabbath is it? It's the Lord's. That this was something that God designed. And God wanted them to, to make sure they understood that this wasn't about Moses, this wasn't about rules, this wasn't about regulations. This is something that I've designed. This is something that I've commanded. It's his Sabbath. Number two, he's going to lay out something else here. In verse 13, he's going to say, it's a sign between me and you. Guys, this was a special 
reminder to the nation of Israel. God had given many signs. Remember, remember when the flood came? God was talking to Noah and he says, I'm going to give you a sign of this covenant that I'm never going to flood the earth again. I'm going to put it in the sky. It's going to be a rainbow. And every time you see that rainbow, you're going to be reminded that I'll never, I'll never destroy the earth with a flood again. It was a sign. So that whenever it starts raining really, really hard and you're going, uh-oh, what's going to happen now? You kind of look up and go, okay, God said he wasn't going to flood us again. And every time you kept the Sabbath, it was a reminder that God was with them. It was a sign between the nation of Israel and his people. It was an outward reminder. It was an outward indicator that God is in a relationship with his nation and with his people. And so they were to have this reminder constantly. No, notice, notice what he says there at the end of verse 13. That you may know that I'm the Lord who sanctifies you. As this Sabbath day was going to be a constant reminder to them, but it was also going to be a day where they would get to know God. They're going to know that I'm the Lord. You're going to know that I'm the Lord. And, and really, as we set a day aside, as we, as we pursue God to worship God, it should be a constant growing in our knowledge of Him. It should be a constant, man, I, 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 I'm coming so that I can know God in a greater way. And I, I think not just on, on, on you know, Sunday or on Wednesday, but that, that, that should be our daily pursuit. But there's something that happens when God gathers His people together corporately and assembles them together. That, that God is in the midst. Remember what Jesus said? He says, when two or three are gathered in my name, I'm in the midst of them. The body of Christ is, is, is his representation on earth. When the body of Christ gathers together, man, there, there, there's something that transpires. And so it's interesting that when, when he's telling them here, look, I, you're, you're, you're going to have the knowledge of God. This is why I want you to gather, gather together so that you know that I am the Lord. And that's when as we grow together in the, in the knowledge of him, man, that that is, is one of the, the, the main purposes as we gather together. And it's also for you and I, it's a reminder. It's a reminder of what? It was a reminder that God created the heavens and the earth. Six days he worked. He tells them that on, in almost in every instance. And then he tells them, look, let me tell you what had happened. Six days I worked and I created everything. And then on the seventh day I rested. And you're going to have that same model for your life that you're going to work for six days. And then on the seventh day you're going to rest. And it's to remind us that God's the one who's in control of everything. God's in control. And really it comes down to are you willing to obey him? Are you willing to trust him? Am I willing to, to set my priorities aside and put God as my highest priority because God had instructed me to set a day aside to worship him and not, you know, not just two hours aside or just three hours aside or four. He, that, that, that day is set aside where, where my attention and my focus is serving God and knowing God and honoring God. And it's incredible because It's this day, every day, every week, that we're to meet with God. And that, that's what the children of Israel were learning, man, that, that it, every day, every week, one day a week, is that they would, they would meet with God at the tabernacle, and it was there where the cloud would over, over, uh, be over the tabernacle, and it was a sign that God's presence was there. And they would come and they would offer their sacrifices. They would come and, and, and do their worship. And they knew that they had spent time knowing God. Guys, I, here's, what, here's, here's kind of what I would encourage you and, and just exhort you that this evening is that God's greatest pursuit is that you know him. And it should be your greatest pursuit to know him. Remember in John chapter 17, in the third verse, Jesus says this. It, this was Jesus praying. This is Jesus is really, this is, if you want to talk about the Lord's Prayer, it's found in John chapter 17. And in John cha chapter 17, in the third verse, Jesus says this. 
This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, check this out, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. This is eternal life. This is, this is what life's all about. Is that you would know God and that you would know His Son, Jesus Christ. And that pursuit of knowing God, it, it, it doesn't happen because I met God you know, when I was 12 or when I was 14. It happens as I spend time with Him weekly, as I spend time with Him daily. As I, as I come and say, look, God, God I, I, I want to know you more. And, and not as some duty or some burden. It should be the thing that you're going, man, I, I, I want to know God in a greater way. And I'll never do that unless I spend time with Him. I'll never do that unless I gather together with His people. It's interesting that He tells them at the end of that, of verse 13, He says, I'm the Lord God who sanctifies you. That, that word sanctify means that you're being set apart, set apart from the world, set apart from every other pursuit, that, that your life is set apart for God. And it's the church that, that takes that title, guys. We, the body of Christ, are the ones that are set apart for God. And I think every time we gather together, we're reminded of that. That, that this isn't about me, man. This is about me knowing Him, growing in the knowledge of Him, growing in my, in my relationship with Him. When you get into the New Testament, one of the things that, that happens is that Jesus didn't follow all the customs and traditions of, of the religious leaders and the Pharisees. Because when his disciples were hungry, they got some of, some of, the, some of the wheat and they began to rub their hands together and they would, they would eat you know, the, the, the little kernel that would come out of it. And the, and the Pharisees saw that as working because they were winnowing. Right? They, they, they were harvesting, and then when they blew the shaft away, they were winnowing. And the Pharisees had come to Jesus, and they said to him, Lord, why do they do what is unlawful on the Sabbath? So, so the Pharisees had come to Jesus and going, look, you're, you're, you're walking, all your disciples, these guys that you're supposed to be teaching, they're doing work on the Sabbath. And Jesus said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry? he and those with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abathar, the high priest, and he ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priest, and also gave some to those who were with him. And then Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also the Lord of the Sabbath. Wow. Notice what Jesus said. Look, th th this isn't some legalistic thing. This, this is the heart thing. Guys, I, I thought there was something very, very interesting as Jesus is talking to the, to the Pharisees. He says, let me tell you something. Man wasn't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. The Sabbath is something that's to be a blessing for us, not some kind of bondage for us. And it's interesting that he didn't say for the Jews, he said for man. Isn't that cool? He made it for man. Mankind is, is the thought there that it's, it's for all of us, not just for the Jews. I think sometimes we read that and go, oh, that's just something between Jew, the Jews and, G and God. That it wasn't just for the Jews, it was for man. And then what's, what's amazing is that he's telling them that this day was to be a holy day. That's what he tells them in verse 14 and verse 15. It used to be a day that was to be set apart. It wasn't business as usual. It wasn't doing your own thing on this day. They were to set this day apart as God's day. This is God's day. It's not my day. This belongs to God. I don't do what I want to do on this day. It's a day that I set apart for the worship of God. And it was punishable by death. That sound a little severe? It was punishable by death. <laughs> You're kind of going, wait a second, I mean, isn't that a little radical? Why, why would God set such a, a, a severe punishment for breaking the Sabbath? 
I, t- turn to Numbers chapter 15. Check this out. Interesting, interesting s- incident takes place in Numbers chapter 15. Look at verse 32 with me. Watch this. Numbers 15, they're still, the children of Israel are still in the wilderness. They, they had already, you know, received the law and they're already walking with God. Look at N- Numbers 15, verse 32. Now, while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And those who found him ga- gathering sticks brought him to Moses and to Aaron and to all of the congregation. And they put him under guard because it had not been explained what they should do to him. And the Lord said to Moses, The man must surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. So as the Lord commanded Moses, all the congregation brought him outside the camp, and they stoned him with stones, and he died. And I think Moses is even going, God, isn't that a little bit too severe? And all of those guys who caught him gathering the sticks go, isn't that a little bit crazy? And so what did they do? They grab him, they know they go, hey, we're going to hold you in in the little prison here. We're going to go talk to Moses and we'll be back. And and, and Moses goes and talks to the Lord and goes, Lord, is that really what you want us to do? And he goes, yeah, I want you to to do it. And he asks the question, well, wait wait a second. Why, Why would God put a guy to death for gathering sticks? And I, I, w- I would propose to you that God is protecting and preserving his relationship with his people by doing so. God saw that, that, that the whole reason he had brought him out of Egypt was so that they would have a God, so that they would be in a relationship with God. And God said, if, 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 if that's not what this is all about, then you're missing it. This is about a relationship with you. And you're never going to have a relationship with me unless you're pursuing me and you're knowing me and you're growing in the knowledge of me and and you're taking the time to worship me. It's never going to happen. And so he sets a precedence. Look, if that's not your desire, if that's not your, 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 your want is to have a relationship with me, then you're going to infect everybody else. And he goes, I'm going to cut you off. That's heavy. That God would even say that. I like what one commentator said, um, Riken Hughes, he said this. This penalty n- no longer applies. Remember that there are three types of Old Testament law. There was the moral law, there was a civil law, and there's a ceremonial law. The moral law is God's universal and eternal will for all people in all places. The civil law was the Old Testament Israel as a nation under the direct rule of God. Its judicial sanctions are no longer binding, and the ceremonial law governed the rituals of religious worship, such as the system of sacrifice. Now, he shares that, look, we're not, I'm not saying if you, if, if you don't honor the Sabbath, we're going to take you outside. We're going to stone you, okay? That, that, that's, not, that's not applicable today. But I, but I, but, but I, I think that there's a, there's, there's a precedence that God wanted to establish that the worship of him has to be a priority. That honoring him has to be a priority in our lives. That setting a time aside that, that we're going, God, I, 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 I want to know you. I want to seek you. I want to follow you. And that we're doing it as a body, as a people together is something that should take a precedence in each of our lives. Guys, I, I pray you're here tonight because you're going, man, I, I want to know God more. I want to worship God. And I pray as we gather on Sunday morning, that, that's why you're here, not, not just because it's, it's a cool place to hang out or all my friends are there. It's because, man, I want to know God. I need to grow closer to Him. I need to seek after Him. Because I know that when I do that, My life is changed. My life is transformed. I'm actually fulfilling the very purpose that God had created me. And so it's interesting that 
we come all the way up to the New Testament, and you go, well, wait a second, Pastor, wh why, don't, why don't we worship on the Sabbath? And there's churches that have built their whole ministry around, their whole doctrine around, you've got to keep the Sabbath day. You know, there's the Seventh-day Adventist and many other, you know, churches that go, man, if you don't keep the Sabbath, then, you know, you're, 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 not, you're not doing, you're not obeying the Bible. What's interesting is you go back into the book of Acts and you look at the first century church. In the book of Acts chapter 2, it, it tells us that it was on the day of Pentecost that the Holy Spirit came upon and when the church was actually born, when the church was birthed, was on the first day of the week. It would have been 50 days after the Sabbath, which would have put them, 49 days would have been seven weeks later. The 50th day would have been the first day of the week, which would have been Sunday. So the Holy Spirit came upon the church on the 50th day. And one thing that you find out as you're going through the book of Acts is that they would gather together on the first day of the week to break bread. They would gather together on the first day of the week to give their offerings. It tells us in the book of Acts 20, verse 7, on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. That was when they got, the church gathered together on the first day of the week to worship. Why? Because it's the number of what? New beginnings. As you go to seven day, seven's the number of perfection, eight is the number of new beginnings. And God had made a new covenant with the church. Not based upon the old covenant. When you Go back and, and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16 in the second verse. It says, On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay aside something, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. You see, the church gathered in Corinth on the first day of the week and goes, hey, when you guys are gathering together, take an offering for the missionaries that you're going to, that I'm going to be taking the, the, the resources to. So they had gathered together on the first day of the week. We, we find in... in the resurrection took place when? On the first day of the week. When Jesus rose from the grave, it's also referred to as the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day. Why, why do they refer to the Lord's Day? Because that's when Jesus conquered the grave. When Paul, I'm sorry, when John, the revelator, in, John chapter, uh, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, it says that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And he was taken up and he got the revelation from God. But it was a day of worship for him as he had been worshiping the Lord on the eighth day or also the first day of the week. And so it's interesting that this precedence had, had taken place into, into the first century. Justin Martyr, who who lived from 100 to 160 A.D., Justin Martyr said this, Sunday is the day on which we all hold our communion assembly before Jesus Christ, our Savior, on the same day that he rose from the dead. So all the way back from the you know, early 100s, the church had gathered together on the first day of the week to worship. In 1994, Clement of Alexandria praised a fellow believer. He said, he is in fulfillment of the precept according to the gospel. He keeps the Lord's Day. Sunday was celebrated as the Lord's Day throughout the early church. And so those who, who you know, want to go, wait a second, we're supposed to keep the Sabbath. How come we're not worshiping on Saturday rather than on Sunday? You go back and you find out that the church now, it, it wasn't that they just said we don't keep the Sabbath. It's like, man, now we got a different day that we set apart because it's a celebration of what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's the fulfillment of the new covenant and the new beginning that we have because of Jesus Christ. It's interesting that Paul, when he's writing to the Colossians, turn there with me. Watch, check this out. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians. Second chapter, the 16th verse. Watch what he says. 
So let no one judge you in your food or in your drink. Those are the dietary laws that the children of Israel were, the, the legalists were still trying to say, you got to still, you know, you can't eat pork, you, 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 you can't eat shellfish. You know, they were still wanting to keep the dietary laws. And Paul says, let no one judge you in your food or in your drink. That's what he says. Or regarding a festival or a new moon or a Sabbaths, which are shadows of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Because this, this isn't about the day. There's a principle that we're to set a day aside. But it's not about the day. In the book of Romans, chapter 14, and we're on Sunday mornings, we're in the book of Romans, we'll be getting there eventually. But in Romans chapter 14, check this out real quick. Romans chapter 14, I love the picture here, man, as he, as he lays all this out for us in the book of Romans. Watch this, the 14th chapter. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but do not dispute over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or he falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. Look what he says in verse 5 now. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe it the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, and he who gives God thanks, and he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat, and he gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, wh whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's. Isn't that cool? He said, this, this, is, this isn't about, you know, going, oh, you don't keep the Sabbath? You're, you know, how horrible. You eat that? How horrible. That, this is between you and the Lord. Your, 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 your day of rest may be Wednesday, or it might be Tuesday, or it might be, you know, Saturday, it might be Sunday, but that you're taking a day aside, you're going, man, this belongs to God. And that it's his day, and that I'm going to worship him. Because the whole, the whole premise of it, guys, is that you would know God. you got to know God. you got to grow in the knowledge of the Lord. That's why the church exists. So that we can gather together and to be built up and equipped. So that we can grow in our gifts we can grow in our in our in our knowledge we can grow in our relationship with him that's why that's why it's important that when brought paul when when the writer of hebrews in chapter 10 verse 25 he says this he says do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as in the manner of some but so much more as you so as you see that day approaching that's heavy because what he's saying is, look, guys, it's important that you gather together, the body of Christ. And that, 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 that should be a regular thing. But then he goes on, he says, and the closer you get to the end, the more important that's going to be. Think about that. Does anybody here think we're not close to the end? <laughs> if, you, if you don't think we're close to the end, man, you're smoking something. It, think, think, things are all lining up, man. We're, we're looking at this, this could be the week. This could be the month. This could be the year. I mean, we're getting, we're getting close here. And how much more do we need each other to stir each other up to good works? How much more do we need to encourage one another in our walk with God? And I think it's even more so then once a week, I, I think it's necessary for us to gathering on multiple times a week because we need, what, we, we need that kind of encouragement because we're seeing our world decay right around us. 
and it's, it's, that, it's that, man, man, what do, what's going on in your life? And, man, pray for me here, and this is what's going on over here, and my work is crazy, and that, that we're encouraging one another to walk with God. You know what the enemy, all, all he needs to do is isolate you, and he'll take you out, man. But together, together is the body of Christ, man. There's strength. And, and it, what, what's amazing is this, this whole picture is that he's in, in the book of Rome is he's saying, guys, it, this isn't about the food and it's not about the day. It's about knowing him. It's about seeking him. It's about growing in the knowledge of him. And that'll never happen unless you spend time with him. It'll never happen unless you're talking about him, unless you're studying, unless you're, 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 you're maturing in your Christian life. You, you see, those things won't happen by, ac- by accident. It don't happen by osmos- osmosis. It happens as you, as you seek him, as you, as you grow in the knowledge of him. It's an interesting, well, let me go back to, to Exodus there, and then, and then I want to close in the book of 1 John, an interesting passage there. Exodus chapter 30. Look at what he says there in verse 16. Therefore, every time you... You see the word therefore, you're, you're reminded that, that he's saying, he, here's the conclusion of all of this. Here, here, here's the main point that I'm trying to get to you. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the, va- the Sabbath throughout their generation. Check it out. As a perpetual covenant. So this, this isn't just for, for your lifetime or for your children's lifetime. This is to be something that's to happen throughout generations, per- perpetually. That means on and on and on. This will be a day set apart. And watch what he says there in verse 17. It's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Guys, th- th- there, there, is, there is this idea that your soul needs to be fresh. And I don't think it's just for your soul. I think it's for your physical body as well. The day of rest. Where you're just going, man, my, I, I, I am going to be refreshed in my spirit and in my body. And I'm going to set a day aside where it, where it belongs to God. There's refreshing that happens in that. Medically, it's been proven, man, that you have a better mental, a better physical state of mind, a better, you know, you, that it, it's just a health, even, even when it comes to letting the land rest for, on the Sabbath year, that the land produces more fruit. God, God designed all this, guys. It, he didn't do it. He's not telling this stuff by accident. He knows what you need, both physically and spiritually. And that's why he had, he had established these things, so you can be refreshed. But note, notice what he says in verse 18. And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. Now, now does that mean that God's got a finger? No. He's giving us some, some visual, right? It's not like, you know, God is spirit, and those who worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth. But he's giving us some, 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 some picture for us that, that God's the one who established the tablets. And he established the tablets and everything he says on those tablets. Remember back in, in, in the Ten Commandments, what was the first thing that God had told the children of Israel? I'm the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other God beside me. And then he tells them, you shall not make for yourself a carved image in the likeness of anything in heaven above that is on the earth beneath or is in water or under un, under the uh, in the water under the earth you shall not bow down to them nor shall you serve them for I am the Lord your God I'm a jealous God what's this all about guys this is all about relationship it's all about relationship that that was God's whole intent for the commandments 
was that you would have a relationship with him. That you would know him. That you would grow in that knowledge of him. And there's one, one thing I, I, I've discovered, man, walking with the Lord now, going on 30 years, I can't even believe, you know, it's going to be 30 years. Next year, 30 years. Walking with God. And this is what I know, man. The more I know him, the, the more I realize how messed up I am. <laughs> the more I need him. The more I'm, I, I, I have to put my confidence in him. And, and the more you know him, man, the more you understand how holy he is and how worthy of our praise he is. In, in the book of 1 John, chapter 2, I'm going to ask you to turn there. and we'll, this, this We're going to close it tonight. 1 John, chapter 2. Check this out. The book of 1 John, what an incredible epistle. And I'd encourage you to, to read through it, man. What, what, what a... What a reminder of, of, of knowing God and, and what it looks like to know God. But watch what he says in verse 3. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. Watch this. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. And he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Wow. How do you know that you know God? Because I, I obey him. And that's the fruit of knowing God. It, it's that now I have the desire to follow Him, to, to obey what He says. I, the commandments that He gives me, I, I want to begin to live my life in such a way that, it, that, that I am I'm pleasing Him. If you say that you know Him and you don't obey His commandments, John says, you're a liar. You don't know Him. <laughs> oh no, I know God, but I'm living in habitual sin. I know God, but I, 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 don't, I don't want to obey what he tells me to do. Then, then there's a problem here, guys. You don't know him. That's the issue. That's the real problem. You don't know him. I, I can continue to live however I want to live, even though I know it's against what God says. Then you don't know him. And the whole goal is to know him. In, in chapter 5, verse 20 of 1 John, just, just a... Again, I said the whole book. I could, I could, we can, we can go through multiple places here where he, he, he brings us out. But look at, look at verse twenty of chapter five. And we know that the Son of God has come. He's given us an understanding that we may know Him who is true, and we are in Him who is true in His Son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. We know him. And you can know him. And that, that's why, that's why when, when God is putting such severe punishment for keep breaking the Sabbath, it wasn't because God just trying to be cruel and un unreasonable, it was because God's saying the highest priority that you as a nation are going to have is to know me. And it should be the highest priority that we individually should have is I want to know God. I want to know God. You know, there's something that happens when, when that spark, man, that, that happens in your life. I want to know God because you can't get enough. You, you, you're, not, you're not content with, you know, I, you know, I, I go to church on Sunday or I, I go to church on Wednesday or I kind of do my duty. When, when you pursue God, man, you're going, man, I, I, I can't get enough of him. I, I remember for when I first got saved, it, it was like, what I, I don't know what happened. I, I, I hated to read. I hated to read. And, and I couldn't stop reading everything. Everyone, some, every time someone said, hey, read this book. You know, took, that night I'd, I wouldn't go to sleep because I wanted to know God. J.G.I. Packer wrote a book called Knowing God. I remember, you know, I probably didn't sleep for a week, but two hours a night because I, I wanted to, do you want to knowing God? That's what it means to know. Give me that book. I want to know God. And it should be something that we're pursuing Continually, guys, knowing God. 
want to know him. And knowing him is going to be a life of obedience to him. And a life of surrender to him. And I think this whole picture that God is giving to the nation of Israel there at the end of Exodus chapter 31 there, as he, he wanted them to understand. Now, this, this, is, this is where we're going next week, just to kind of give you a, a, a prelude of what's coming up. The children of Israel are there worshiping a golden calf. And they were going to call it a holy cow. <laughs> right after they had told God, no, God, we want to we'll, we follow you. We want to, you know, whatever. And they, it, it didn't take long before it was, they're, they're there now fashioning a golden calf just like they did in Egypt. Because it, it, the problem wasn't the outward. The problem was the inward. And, and we, we have an inward problem, guys. The problem isn't, isn't what's happening on the outside. The problem's the heart. It's the heart. It's the issue. And we've got to surrender our heart and get rid of the idols that are in our lives so that we can love God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul.